Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. My name is Laura Bowen, and I'm the Executive Director at USTA Florida. And today, we have a special episode focusing on our physical and mental well-being. I am excited today to be joined by two guests who've been on our podcast before, but not together. So today they get to do this together. First up, we have Michelle Krause, and Michelle is the USTA Cardio Tennis Consultant. Welcome back to the podcast, Michelle. Thanks, Laura. And joining Michelle and I today is Larry Lauer, and Larry is the Mental Skills Specialist at USTA Player Development. Welcome back, Larry. Thanks, Laura. This will be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm going to learn a lot from both of you, as I always do, and hopefully our audience will as well. Um, so before we get started on our topic today, I was wondering if each of you would share a little bit about your background and how you became involved in tennis. And Larry, maybe I'll start with you and then go over to Michelle. Sure, thanks. So uh, I have a PhD in exercise and sports science, specializing in sports psychology uh, from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. So been doing uh, mental performance consulting for over over 20 years now. Uh, previously, I was at Michigan State University and with USA Hockey's National Team Development Program. Then the last nine years, I've been with USTA Player Development uh, and, and working closely with our players and our coaches and our staff. Uh, my kind of beginning in tennis, I mean, I would guess it was you know watching great American players playing in tournaments, McEnroe, Connors, uh, you know, growing up and, and watching them and wanting to play and then going out to local parks and playing. Uh, I grew up in rural Western Pennsylvania, so we didn't really have any leagues or anything organized. So I would just go out and play in the summer on my own, kind of self-taught. Uh, and then, you know, once I went to university, Clarence University of Pennsylvania for my undergrad, I met uh, a coach there who could teach me and then learn from him and just continue to stay in the game and, and love it. And uh, been fortunate to work with tennis players ever since then. Uh, you know, for the last 20 plus years. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to 20 plus more. Excellent. Well, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got involved in tennis? Sure. I, I played tennis, you know, from a young age, but I was never one of those, you know, skill tournament, high level performance players, like many people kind of do that and end up in the tennis industry. So I kind of did all sports, you know, pretty okay at everything, but not great at, you know, any one specific thing. Um, taught a little bit before college and then after college, um, actually started teaching some tennis again. And then I never stopped. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm not sure how these things work out sometimes. I think partly I, I did not play college tennis. And I, I think I do attribute some of my longevity in the industry to not playing college tennis, actually. You know, not that because people should play college tennis. But I and I think Larry can agree with this. We know a lot of friends, colleagues, people who have played college ball and then they never pick up another racket mm, again, again right? right? Yeah. It, and yeah, and that, you know, burnout, whatever, you know, terminology we want to use it. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just a love of mine. And um, I, I, again, I, the best, I, I just never stopped doing tennis. It's, it's, I guess it's, it's in our DNA and it's what I love to do. So that's kind of how um, I got to this point and I have been managing um, cardio tennis since its inception in 2005. Wow. So that's been a long time of cardio. I think often people don't realize it's been around since 2005. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Excellent. Well, I credit you, Michelle. Actually, you're the reason I probably play tennis, you and my mom. I mean, uh, my mom loves tennis, but uh, it was discovering cardio that made me actually want to get on a tennis court. So um it's been great, and uh, I appreciate all that you do because I don't think that door would have opened to me if it wasn't for cardio. It's the stories we love to hear, Laura. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about that in this podcast. <laughs> yes. Well, today we're actually going to talk a, a little bit about health and wellness, and you know there are two pieces of that equation. I think there's the mental health piece, and then there's the physical health piece. 
And I wanted to ask if each of you could maybe share a little bit about how you view each of those pieces and maybe how they fit together. So Michelle, why don't I start with you this time and then Larry, you can chime in after Michelle. So I think it's pretty fair to say they um, are very tied together and or they complement each other. Um, if we are being physical, um, that is ultimately going to help our mental well-being. Um, I believe there is plenty of research and studies out there that show the tie-in between those two and the benefit of, you know, being physically active and all the things that does to our body from a chemical standpoint to help us achieve better um, overall mental fitness as well. And I think Larry can probably expand on that a little bit and he might have some better numbers or documentation or pinpointing to that. So I'll, uh, I'll toss it over to him. Yeah, well, the, the research is pretty clear on, on this subject, Michelle, that, that exercising is not only good for your body, it's good for your brain because we're one whole system. When we experience something physically, we experience it psychologically and as well as experience something psychologically we experience it physically so one of the one of the major things is that physical activity is going to reduce your stress level especially the kind of activity that uh is, is enjoyable and you're not overdoing it um, and tennis has been a great sport for for so many people in terms of getting out and moving uh so being healthy that way, strengthening their bones because they're out there playing. Uh, we just heard some data yesterday in a meeting about how, you know, uh, playing tennis actually increases bone density. So, uh, which is a very important thing in kids and as well in adults. And, um, you know, the fact that again, from a mental health perspective, not only are you reducing stress, but if you're doing something that you love, you're doing with other people you enjoy being it with. So being a social activity, having connections with others so you're not isolated. Uh, and yet it can be done in a safe way, you know, during during this pandemic where you can play and, and not be right on top of one another mm -hmm. in a closed space. So there's a lot of a lot of great benefits to uh, being in tennis physically and mentally for the whole human system. Mm -hmm. And you know, even changing some of the neurochemicals in the body and I don't go too deep into that, but you know, exercise is one of the key factors in terms of being healthy your, during your lifespan. Go ahead, Michelle, did you want and to And I was to just that? gonna say, just to tag on to Larry, exercise is medicine, mm -hmm. right? So and, that's, and that's a saying that, you know, doctors and such and fitness and health experts have been saying, but I don't think that we're saying it enough. And there was a time period where, um, and I'm, the organization is slipping my mind and Larry might remember it, but, um, you know, we, we, the, the goal was to try to get doctors to prescribe actual exercise mm -hmm. as opposed to prescribing drugs. So, um, I just think that's a little saying that we should probably say a little more frequently in our messaging. Yeah, it's a good point for sure. And, you know, let's stay on that for a minute because May is national tennis month. Um, and I know, Michelle, you've actually been on the road, you're on the road now, uh, promoting physical activity through tennis. And, you know, as I shared before, uh, you were one of the reasons and what you do is kind of how I became a fan of playing tennis. So can you talk a little bit about how you infuse physical fitness in tennis and why tennis is a great sport to get people active? So... It's interesting those those words, Laura. Um, if I'm repeating it correctly, how do you infuse physical fitness into tennis? I'm gonna ch I'm gonna reword that, okay? okay? And I'm gonna say that tennis is fitness, okay? Okay. We don't have to incorporate any physicality into it. It already is the ideal perfect fitness activity. Part of the challenge is that our coaches are not delivering it as such mm -hmm. and or people, recreational players don't understand how to do that on their own. So we don't need to add anything to tennis 
to make it more physical or make it a fitness activity. Okay. It's really all about touches on the ball. Okay. So if we're touching the ball frequently, the whole um, process of getting to the ball, actually striking it and recovering is an immense physical activity unto itself. However, tennis is played very start and stop where there's a lot of ball picking up, there's serving in between, which, you know, I'm not saying take away the serve, okay, but but there's things that can slow down this practice mm -hmm. of increasing the number of reps on the ball. So if we were all on that same page and our coaching was more geared to that, um, where, you know, we're not having people stand in lines, uh, we have incredible tools in our sport. And that tool is the different colored balls that we have. And if we were to, again, embrace those balls for all abilities and all ages, okay, that unto itself makes tennis the ideal fitness activity. So we don't need to add jump ropes. We don't need to add push-ups. We we just we don't need to do those things because it's really already perfect in its form. It's just that we need to make sure that coaches and consumers understand um, how to practice it and how to deliver it in that fashion. Larry, does that make sense to you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, for years, we've been talking about no lap. No lines, no lectures mm -hmm. in, in sport, <laughs> especially youth sport. And, and so your, your points are great ones. You know, I, I think from a coaching standpoint, we have to be creative. And I think, you know, the programs, some of the programs that USTA does, including cardio tennis, get pretty creative in terms of how to keep people moving. Uh, I think you need to know what your goal is for why you're out on the court. If your goal is to get a lot of physical activity, then you want to design what you do to keep moving. If the goal is to work on technique, uh, then it's going to slow things down, especially if you have more advanced players and they're working on specific things. But those players are getting more than enough movement uh, when they play points that, uh, you know, they're getting you know, the activities that they need. But I think you, you got to know what the goal is. And then as a coach, you want to make sure that uh, you're achieving that goal. If, if the goal is you know, physical and, and mental well-being. Again, movement is a, is, is a medicine, as we've talked about, and getting moving. And, you know, I even think, you know, playing a lot of games to the level that you're at so that, you know, if they're struggling with the serve, yeah, there's times you need to work on the serve. Maybe that's a recovery time. But let's do a lot of ground stroke yeah. games that gets them moving, gets their heart rate up. And then when they're bringing that heart rate down, maybe they can practice the serve some. So, I mean, I think there's different ways to do it. I think we just need to be creative. I think you both made great points there. And I think, Michelle, going back to something you said about helping people understand how they can do this. I can't tell you how many times I'm out in a neighborhood and I see a family, which I'm going to ask you guys a question about a little bit later, on a tennis court with yellow balls. And most of them have never played before. And one person hits the ball and it's over the head. And it's clearly not giving them a whole lot of activity or a lot of movement. And it's not super fun. Um so I think, Michelle, the, the idea is that the concepts that you're saying is, is how do we play in a way that is, you know, both active and fun and using the different tools can help that as opposed to just like using one tool or to your point, Larry, you know, going out there and, and doing that. Hey, we're going to spend a whole class working on serves, which, you know, might not be fun for most people. So I want to go to the mental health for a second before we come back to to sort of the the play part again. Um, Larry, I know we've we've seen all kinds of things come out about uh, the importance of mental health in today's world and um, particularly just the heaviness with what's been happening in the world for years now. And I think you guys said it earlier about physical activity really being key to mental well, uh, mental health. So can you talk a little more about that and how physical activity and what types of physical activity um, are important for people to partake in and just to take care of their mental health. Yeah, it, it certainly is a big part of, of mental and emotional well-being is, is movement. And I think as a 
field in, in psychology, sports psychology, um, you know, it's something that we talk about all the time uh, as a way to to feel better. Uh, you know, whether you're you're feeling down and and want to maybe not move so much, doing the opposite can really get you know, you get your feeling better, you're changing, like I said, neurochemicals in the brain, you're getting the heart pumping blood, you're, you're just changing your mood. Uh, so exercising, getting out and playing tennis, different sports, uh, doing those things with friends, uh, having those connections is huge. For a lot of us, competing is, is uh, just inherently enjoyable. Um, we love to compete. I still do to this day. And so that in and of itself, seeing, you know, if you can beat somebody else, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, or just seeing if you can improve your game. You know, there's so many different reasons why uh, you can get motivated and get moving. Uh, you just have to find the ones that really are for you. Um, what is that about in different reasons? And then, you know, we just have to you know, make sure that the uh, people have that opportunity to play. But, uh, you know, tennis, tennis helps us in so many different ways. Uh, you think about just the, the cognitive development in terms of having to, to read the ball uh, and then get your body in positions to hit it. Uh, the decision-making you have to do like this all the time, mm -hmm. you're reading a ball and then you're making yep. decisions. Um, just what it, it promotes in terms of independence and uh, thinking on your own and, and taking control over your life. You know, I, I was going to say earlier, you know, if, if you want people to play tennis and stay in the game, they got to feel like they're getting better while they're playing because getting better is a motivator. They yeah. got to feel like it's their choice, that they have some say in why they play, which goes back to your reasons for playing and doing it for those reasons. And you want to have connections or relationships when you play. Really good coaches, maybe it's with family members, really close friends. When you do it in that way, it becomes a lot of fun uh, to play the game. I know when I was at Michigan State University, we had a 4-0 team and we became really close and, and those practice nights and those times we played together were just an absolute joy. I had so much fun playing with those guys and, you know, I miss them today, you know, because we had so much fun just training and competing together. That's so interesting. What those, I wrote those three points down because, you know, going back to what you all said earlier, like what is the philosophy of, of a coach or somebody that's bringing people out to play tennis and, those three things psychologically, I've never heard anybody say that, but it makes a lot of sense is they have to know they're getting better, that it's their choice, you know, that um, what their goals are and they're choosing to work on that and that they have these these uh, human connections that they're making. Yeah. And I think if we all kind of kept those top of mind and, and I think we focus a lot on the pathway and what's the right way to play and what direction you're supposed to go. But this is more of a of more of a psychological side of it to say these are the three motivators that yeah. keep a person engaged. And I'll just say real quick, this comes from self-determination theory, which is one of the strongest uh, theories on motivation. So we, we really want that, I believe, to be the backbone of how we promote what we do, because I think that those things get people excited about what they're doing. You know, if you can get those three things in the program. I should, that just sort of opened up a whole nother podcast idea I'll have to do on the idea of a pathway and is there one right pathway? I have to make a note on that. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, getting back to um, to you, Michelle, I wanted to talk about kids and families a little bit. And when it comes to kids, you know, we hear a lot about childhood obesity and kids maybe aren't as active as they were in the past. Why is it important, do you think, for parents and families to support physical exercise from a young age? And what makes tennis a good tool for them to do that? So, again, I, I kind of twist things around a little bit um, because we, 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 we talk about that topic a lot. And I think what's the most important is, is that we actually get more adults engage with tennis because the kids are ultimately going to do what the parent does. So we, we do focus um, tremendous uh, resources and energy towards kids, which is great and we should always do that. I feel that we neglect the adults. And you can look at um, high performance, top level 
um, tennis athletes. And I, there's a number, I don't know what it is, but the majority of them had parents that played tennis at a high level. So we don't need all kids to play tennis at a high level. We just need them to like the sport and be able to utilize it their whole entire life. But we've got to get the parents engaged in the sport. So if the parent is actually participating in some tennis activities, they're understanding how great the benefits are. And then they're, they're going to be that much more likely to pass that on to their kids. So my focus is, is adult recreational players. My focus is getting adults that don't play tennis to play tennis. And ultimately, the, the better we get at that, the more kids we will have playing that our great sport. I love that perspective. Larry, do you, do you see that similarly? Yeah, I 100% agree with what Michelle's saying. We did the role of parents and tennis study in the 2000s, and we interviewed nine professional tennis players. And their parents played. They might not have played at a high level, but they were in the game. They were around the game. They enjoyed the game. So it was kind of, a, it was a fam. in most of those families, it was a family activity. They would go to the park together and play. They would go to the club. A lot of those players talked about how their parents would go and play at the club and they'd be hitting on the side and in the last 10 minutes, they would hit with them, you know, on the court. So they had these fond memories of how tennis was a part of their family. It wasn't uh, something that was on the calendar that you need to go and do. And this, this was a fond family activity. And I think that's important. I think it's how then going off what Michelle says, as, as adults, we present the game to kids, right? So if, if we love the game and we're interested in the game, but we turn it into drilling and just constant sort of, uh, you know, just technical and, and maybe right. over competing at a young age, then they're not going to see the joy in the way that you picked it up. And that, that goes back to that self-determination theory that mm -hmm. we want them to fall in love with it so that it's theirs right so they get exposed to it at a young age because their parents play a sibling plays uh, but at some point they need to decide this is what i want to do otherwise they experience anxiety they experience entrapment burnout because they're doing something that they don't really love and then they're getting pressed to do it they're getting pressured to do it so um so those first experiences are huge whether it's a matter of the kind of balls that they're hitting we talked about the different color balls and creating success at a young age, uh, the size of the court, uh, all these things that have become a part of the American tennis landscape and the way we teach it are crucial. But it really, you know, to me, that family aspect uh, doesn't get spoken about enough. Mm -hmm. And Michelle's right. If the adults are interested, you can draw the kids in because they want to play with their mom and dad. They want to play with their siblings. So it's a great way to, to bring more kids in. Love that perspective. That's a good segue kind of to my next question, which is for you, Larry. You know, we talk about and we hear about the pressures that young people are facing today. I mean, one, I think one difference, I was having this conversation with a high school coach over the weekend, is that the social media landscape in particular for kids these days is something that didn't exist when I was a kid, right? The pressures were coming from maybe a, a, a very small, a smaller group and your family was pretty much your main influencer, your main network. Um, and how that's impacting young people and their mental well-being these days is, seems to be pretty significant. So what do you think are some of the ways we can work together to help kids navigate these different types of pressures, which they didn't have before, and maybe build those mental strength skills um, in the world the way it is today? It's a very good question, Laura, and glad you brought it up. You know, with the social media and, and just sort of the way technology has gone, there's a lot of benefits to it. But one of the things when we're overexposed to it or exposed to it on a healthy way, uh, where you know we're opening the world up to our children, to our adolescents, right? They can access so many other viewpoints and ideas and ways of looking at the world, which is good, but you can't regulate it. Mm -hmm. 
or it's not regulated. So you don't know exactly what they're getting as, as a parent and what kind of views and what kind of things are being uh, posted about them. And, and I'm no expert on social media, so I'm not going to go into depth on, on different kinds. But what I would say is one of the things that it does is it generates a lot of thoughts around comparison, mm. right? How is someone else doing? Uh, mm -hmm. Because typically we post good stuff about ourselves, right? We don't go online and post the bad things. So this fear of missing out is a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the comparisons, you know, we've heard in the past, you know, that comparison is the thief of joy. You know, if you can just be present and, and just enjoy what you're doing with your small circle, that's uh, being present with that is often way more enjoyable than worrying about what someone is doing in another state or another country. Um, it does, you know, it makes our children more worldly and there, there's some benefits to that. Uh, so we, you know, there are some benefits, like I said, the anxiety, uh, it, I mean, it's, it comes from a lot of different things, but you know, I, first and foremost, if, if the people closest to us can, can really provide that unconditional love and support then you have that foundation to deal with the other stuff, right? Because if I know no matter what, my parents, my family, they're there for me, they got me back and I've got that deep relationship, then you can deal with the other stuff that comes in, that, that negative stuff that's coming in, which you can't totally avoid if you're an athlete or if you're connected in the social world. So I would say that starts with the parents and, and that can be tricky because as kids get better, there's a sense that the goal becomes about performance and less about the well-being and the enjoyment of the kid. And mm. you've got, you have to keep well-being and enjoyment of the kid at a high level. You can't replace it with performance, not as a parent. As a coach, I would say you still want to make it about fun and development, and that should be the priority. But there are times where performance does end up being the priority, uh, for example, in our pro world. But that's that's much later on for a smaller segment of the population. So if we can focus it on, on what really matters and then along the way, they're going to become good anyway, if they're good, so they can develop the skills and get them with the right coaches and the right programs. So I would say that I would say limiting the social media uh, is very important, knowing what they're getting on, who they're communicating with. You don't you don't want to be, you know, big brothering them all the time, but you should be aware and mm -hmm. you should know what's going on. And it's just as important to surround them with good people in their lives, good coaches, uh, other people who are encouraging, who are positive, but we'll demand from them to be prepared to do the things that it takes to, based on what your goals are, right? Mm -hmm. If you say you want to be good in this game, then you need to come up, come into the practice prepared to have stretched, right. warmed up, you know, these kinds of things. So that's, that's the challenge is, is really knowing what is the goal, not making it your goal as the adult, what is the child one? And that can be hard to figure out at a young age. So, um, but in terms of anxiety, there's a lot of things out in this world that make kids anxious and they're more and more aware of it. And so if we can limit uh, exposure to those things, um, make it about what's important, um, like I mentioned, and really build up those connections and those relationships, I think you can can buffer them. And then all along, you have to be teaching them how to be resilient to uh, the, the, the things that they're going to face, uh, having good perspectives, having a growth mindset, uh, you know, being okay with failure and mistakes because that's part of the process of learning, right. uh, upskilling the kids, helping them know how to communicate with adults, uh, knowing how to set appropriate goals and push themselves toward them knowing how to visualize your success how to talk to yourself mm -hmm. um, and what's that inner talk that dialogue that's going on uh, how to be mindful and aware and present non-judgmentally these skills will buffer them from um, moving too far down that mental health continuum where they're struggling not that it will prevent it 100 percent, but it helps them to avoid some of the struggles and then they need support along the pathway Great insights, Larry. Thank you so much. You. Uh, I have one more question for both of you. Um, and it is, what can USTA and USTA Florida do 
to promote and support both physical and mental fitness and well-being all year round. And Michelle, I thought I'd start with you. Well, I think we have to remain consistent, persistent, and vigilant in our messaging um, regarding the health benefits of tennis. Um, we all know the health benefits, but I feel like we often were preaching to the choir sort of scenario, and we're not getting that message out to other segments of society that, you know, really probably need to be hearing um, these type of messages, because when you, you look at the, the, the list is extremely long of what the health benefits of tennis are. Um, I believe, you know, when Dr. Jack Grapple and Jim Lahren came up with a list about 15 years ago, I think there were 52 bullet points. And then we've condensed that down to 10, um, uh, cause we can't overwhelm people, but I, I, I think you just we we just need to be consistent, repetitive, um, and then we need to we actually need to um, it, you know if we're gonna talk the talk we need to walk the walk. So you know if you are a, a coach that's delivering tennis, well I'm gonna go back to that coach needs to have a, a level of looking looking the part of a fit tennis professional. Um, so, and again, I just really think we have to reach out to other segments, um, that are, you know, not the hardcore tennis people. Yeah. I think that's a great perspective. And you, I think you're right. We, we talk amongst ourselves a lot and I get asked that question a lot. Like, how did you become ED when you weren't, you didn't play tennis? And I'm like, I'm your consumer. I'm your yeah. consumer all day long. I'm your middle yep. aged woman who played other sports that now that doesn't have that option. So right. I think we, we need to really look outside of ourselves and say what, you know, everybody's a potential consumer. So I appreciate you saying that, Michelle. I think that's a great insight to say, how, we got to say it, say it again and, and expand our reach. Yeah. Yeah. Larry, how about you? What, what would you say we need to do to maybe promote and support both physical and mental wellness all year round? Yeah, well, well, good thoughts by both of you. And I, I like how you mentioned this, or wrote this question, because one thing Carl Davies and I and Dr. Sean Fultz Emmons have been talking about in our Lunch and Learn webinars is that mental health is not a May month thing. It's a 12 month thing. It's an everyday thing. And so we've been trying to address that in our webinars every month in different ways and answering our parent questions. So I think one is getting out there and communicating with the masses. Uh, however we can and with these podcasts we do the compete like a champion podcast which is a little bit more high performance and sports science focused but a lot of people do listen to that and then like i said our, our net jam launch and learn webinars for parents so reaching out to them you know going you know michelle mentioned the, the coach and i'll take that a little bit farther uh highly qualified coaches who are trained to get people excited about the game of tennis, right? Because the way that we create the environment has a big role. Like I've seen Michelle, the enthusiasm is just coming out of her and she gets people excited <laughs> she about does. tennis. She gets them excited about yeah. tennis, but that's not how everybody comes to the game with that kind of enthusiasm, that energy, that creativity, that, uh, you know, just that focus. And I think we got to make sure that we're developing enough trained coaches who, who know how to coach at the level that they're at and with the goals in mind of the people who are coming to them and you've got to have really good communication skills organization skills teaching skills uh, good enough tennis skills i don't think you have to be a great hitter but you need to be able to uh, do do this the way where you understand how to coach people uh, so I, I think there's some fundamental things from the coaching side we just need more coaches out there. Um, we have some great coaches out there right now, but they can only impact so many people. Uh, right. So building up our coaching uh, landscape would be huge mm -hmm. for for benefiting the game and people having great experiences. Uh, I know that there's talks about addressing sort of the competition side in tournaments to make them more uh, consumer friendly. And I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, so I'm not going to go too deep into that at all. But giving children a chance to experience different ways to compete 
not just going to a tournament one and done or having yeah. to play three matches in a day in 90 degree weather here in Florida. So there's different formats like junior team tennis and different things that can be done that really gets people engaged. We got to keep promoting those programs as well. Right? There's different ways to, to come into this game and play this game. It's not just a traditional uh, sign up for a tournament, win or go home approach mm -hmm. uh, to the game. You know, it's, I'm probably going to get in trouble just for saying this, but I guess I'm the host, so I can say my thoughts. You can um, say whatever you want. I, I like <laughs> us getting in trouble, Laura. <laughs> you know, I think you touched on something that was really important. You know, we talk a lot, and I get a lot of calls, you know, like, oh, this is what is wrong with the tournament environment. Or this is, you know, this needs to change about tournaments, tournaments, tournaments. And maybe I'm just a, you know, it came from a different world, but that's what a tournament is. It's a higher level of competition. And I liked what you said, Larry, about do we have enough resources for coaches? You know, I always go back to the coach. And I know sometimes there have been people even at USTA who have said, um, you know, who've criticized even junior team tennis and criticized other things. And I, and I always go back and say, but what did the coach advise the child? Mm -hmm. Is the coach aware enough about the child's development or even the adult's development to Michelle's point? And are we offering, are all the resources we're offering to coaches valuing high performance training at this level and devaluing the recreational fun component? And, and that's sort of my wish for the industry is that we could really raise the level of focus on saying mandating training for, you know, how to create a fun environment and how to make match a player with the right, how to create that self-determination that if I come in and I say, what I want to do is I just want to go out and have fun and not embarrass myself. Like that is my life goal in tennis is not to really be embarrassed and be able to kind of have fun with other people. Then mm -hmm. I don't want to be with a coach who's going to train me like a high performance player because right. that's not going to suit my needs. Right. And I just feel like, what the industry does as a whole is try to fix the product without really addressing the approach to coaching and the experience, because we have, we have high performance coaches valued at such a high level. And believe me, they're, they're valuable, but everybody wants to be a high performance coach where I look at what people are doing in high school, they are doing this. They're doing the therapy and the teaching life skills and what the NJTL coaches are doing. Like, we need to value that a little higher. So that that's my that's my little soapbox moment that I'm sure will Ooh. get people fired up. But <laughs> that's where I go. Laura, I love it because it's accurate. And I think what the industry doesn't understand, there's way more Laura Bowens out there, okay, than there are Serena Williams. Okay. Okay. So yes, we know that for sure. <laughs> well, we're not. And I just had to throw out some professional name. Um, but. And again, not to diminish the the high level um, player either, but that's where the majority of our people go. And I'm going to piggyback on Larry and his, his emphasis on the coaches and equipping them better. And I'll just give you an example um, that I recently uh, experienced. So we just did cardio tennis, right? And it was great. And everybody's jacked up and they're empowered and they're joyful. And then the next thing that came on after the cardio tennis court was an adult beginner class. And I'm going to tell you what that looked like. It was 10 people on either side of the court, standing in a line, being fed one ball, hitting the ball, walking. So I was crying <laughs> and I just, I had to leave, you know, I was crying. Okay. So that, those begin, that, those, that a, gr a group of adult beginners, they should have been doing cardio tennis. Yeah. Okay. There's no reason for their, because all that coach has to do is put them on six red courts with the red ball immediately, and they are rallying. It's that easy. They're rallying in five minutes. All right. So it was not my show. So I just, I just moved on. We were doing a uh, coaches training, um, cardio tennis, and what we're working on. Yeah. You know, we're, we're coaching them, uh, we're training them how to deliver cardio, but more importantly, we're coaching them on how to interact with other adults Okay, and how to the things that they can do to empower and motivate them. So the coach um, just by default stands at the net post and just stands there. 
okay, while a game is being, you know, played, et cetera, and they're not moving and they're not even talking. So we are training those coaches to literally move around the court, be addressing people, making eye contact, okay, um, giving out little cues, giving compliments. It's, it's, it's pretty simple, but those are actually the first things a coach should learn, not the forehand grip. It's funny. You just touched on all three of those things Larry mentioned earlier. Are they getting better? Is it their choice? And are they making connections? And how is the coach yeah. leading them through that? And are they not? And I, I, I just, I see it just like you do, Michelle, you know, obviously we brought our beginners over to do triples with you when you were right. so kind to do that. Right. And they picked it up like that and they like easily that. the most fun they had and they still play. So right. our whole purpose was to give them an hour where it was fun and they could see that they actually could play within an right. hour of never touching a ball before. And now yep. they come out and they're hitting balls and they're doing different things and it's their choice. They right. get to decide how they play. And I, I think we, we just need that culture shift, you know, so badly. And I, genuinely appreciate the work that both of you do because I think that you're offering alternate perspectives and you're leaders in the industry. I respect your voices and I, I know that our, our audience will too. So thank you both so very much for all you do and for sharing today. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. They, well, thank you. Yeah. And I would say, you know, these conversations are happening at the USTA. Dr. Paul Roder and his team are talking about these things. So a lot of what I know comes from them because I do different things for them. So these things are being talked about and trying to find the best ways to, to really deliver coach development, coach education across the span. It's not easy to, to get to these people and you got to get new coaches involved. So uh, they're definitely strategizing and trying to find the best ways to do it. So uh, what you're saying is not being lost on people, but it is, it is a challenge. You put it that way. I have confidence this fine group of humans will meet this challenge for sure. Let's hope so. Well, and speaking of um, Dr. Paul Roder, we are um, in Carl Davies work also having, I'm having conversations with them. We are going to be hopefully sooner than later doing some more extensive research specifically on cardio tennis Great. and the, the health benefits and getting some really hard data on that. Um, because, you know, most of our hard, hard data is Michelle's, um, non-official heart rate <laughs> monitoring of two decades. All right. So, so, um, I, I know that we're in good hands with, um, Dr. Roder and Dr. Davies and all of our, our great people at USDA. Uh, I'll be yeah. excited to see that. And, um, you know, like I said, love what you guys are doing. Thank you so much to both of you for joining me today. It's always a pleasure. And I'm sure we'll have many more conversations on this in the future. Great, for those of you, you, oh, you're very welcome. Um, for those of you who are listening to the audio only version of this podcast, just a friendly reminder that you can catch the full video version on USTA Florida's YouTube channel. And you can leave comments and questions on our Facebook page and on our Instagram account. Of course, for all episodes of the Here to Serve podcast, including upcoming topics, guests, and dates, visit ustaflorida.com slash here to serve. Thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your day.